Very comfortable seat. Thank good. You. <laughs> so very good of you to remind me with a comfortable. Well, seat. I think that we could do. We could, I, we I could had do one for less. 33 years of a different kind. That's right. That's right. You were first elected. Your first uh, seat was one in the year I was born, John, 1974. I think that's right. It Gee. makes me feel very young. So I'm delighted. And thank yeah, you for that. Don't remind me. <laughs> uh, well, we have another connection. So I'm the, I'm the MP for Devizes in Wiltshire, and I was mentioning this to John before we came on, and he said, is that Salisbury Plain? And I said, yes. And then what did you say? Well, I said, my dear late departed father, who served in World War I in the 3rd Australian Division, was in camp in Salisbury Plain before departing for the terrible trenches of the Western Front. So it's always sort of struck me. <laughs> As a, I, and I visited um, a beautiful place called Castle Carey. Oh, that's in Somerset, yeah. Further down, yeah. Yeah, and I, I spent the wonderful um, Christmas Eve and Boxing Day there in uh, the 1960s. Okay. Not long after the change of government in that in the year of 1964, but anyway. Okay. I'm burning up our yeah, valuable yeah, time. We haven't, got, we haven't gone long. <laughs> okay. So, John, it's a great honour for me to talk to you, and thank you so much. John Howard, when I was working for Ian Duncan Smith as party leader back in the early 2000s, and we were in the depths of our time in opposition, and we just looked to Australia and to your record, first of coming back from from an unsuccessful period as leader of the opposition. Which oh. It was in very encouraging to Ian, I can tell you. Uh, and, then, uh, and then winning uh, four terms as, as Prime Minister. It's been the most tremendous career. And I want to ask you a few questions about your time in, in power, John. But, but first, just tell us a little about your philosophy, and particularly what I was always inspired by then and now, is that you particularly pitched to this group of Australians that you call the battlers. Mm. Who were they? And what did they believe? Well, they believed in their country. They believed in doing everything they could to help their families. And uh, they believed in rewarding hard work. And they also believed in Australia winning the Ashes. <laughs> we'll allow that. Sometimes that could happen. OK. And then, John, you became Prime Minister and you had a period... I mean, one, one thing to look back on is the economic success of Australia over that time. Really, really remarkable. And you were rewarded with, with, with increased majorities, I think, at most of the elections you won. So you, you were doing something right. But can I just ask you about social policy? Because we're thinking particularly around the social fabric and the underlying foundations of our society. <clears throat> well, I had worked out in opposition the first time around. And I was removed, and then I came back. We won't uh, get into the detail of that. But I had worked out that the tax system did not encourage uh, hard-working, for want of a better expression, traditional families. And I was resolved that when we finally got there, we changed the tax system uh, to help families, particularly single-income families, or uh, a, a family arrangement um, consisted of what I used as a metaphor, um, a part-time nurse and a police sergeant. And, I mean, increasingly, it seemed to me that you had in, in Australian society, you had, uh, when women married and started to have families, there were really three groups. There were those who wanted to remain full-time in their careers. Mm. There were those who wanted to devote their time uh, to um, full-time motherhood. And there were those who were adaptive. They accepted that. They wanted to be in the workforce for part of the time. It was of economic necessity. And uh, instead of wasting our time arguing whether it was right or wrong, I mean, we just had these endless arguments. You had what I, once again, one of a better expression, the more radical feminists would say, oh, you know, you've got to get back into the workforce as quickly as possible. and uh, We've got to have fully funded childcare. Uh, so you can get back into the workforce, which is the main game, and then you had others who say, well, that's not the right thing. You really wanted to give people choice, which is a great classical liberal principle. So I wanted to design the tax system to better accommodate that choice, and we did that. We introduced family tax benefits, extra tax concession for each child, and a special loading for single-income families, and then we came to the vex question, 
of parental leave. And people argue, well, the only thing that really matters is to have generous parental leave. And I worked out in consultation with my advisors that um, that was not very easy to do. And we, we lighted on what became known as a very old fashioned term, a baby bonus. And it, it didn't resonate well with the progressives because it sounded like you know, a state intervening too much in family planning and the like, and that's always odious. And, uh, but we worked out that if you had to pitch the baby bonus at a certain level, uh, particularly when the first child came along, which has maximum uh, financial impact on a couple that both of them been working, that if you pitched it at the right level, that they could treat it as a, for a period of time as paid parental leave, or they could say, thank you very much, that covers all the cost of... Yeah, they could use it in their own way. They in their own way. And I was amazed after it was introduced, a number of women in particular who said to me, gee, it's so expensive having the first child, and we were able to use this to help defray those costs. And, and we avoided this sort of mindless argument uh, about um, <laughs> you know, whether it was the right thing to stay in the workforce or the wrong thing. That's right. Well, we have that exact debate going on in the UK. How the interesting. And, and, yeah. and, of course, it's always about yes, <laughs> the idea that government uh, tells families what they should do. Actually, if you let them make their own choices. Well, I'm a great oh, believer in choice. Yeah. Yeah. You should call it the golden thread. That's right. And it applies in this area, it applies in education. Well, I was going to come on to that now. We've just been hearing from Catherine, who's the hero of the British free schools movement. But again, you were the pioneer in that space. Tell well, us about the education reform. Well, well, at the moment in Australia, and it's been the case for a long time, 34% of school-aged children are educated in non-government schools. Mm. And most of those schools are low and medium fee schools. You will always have enough people in any affluent society such as Britain or Australia, you'll always have enough people who can afford to pay the astronomical fees charged by a small number of people. And I speak as somebody who was totally educated in the government school sector in, in Australia. Our own children, partly in the government system, partly in the private system. Once again, it's a question of choice. And the big change uh, I'm very proud of is that when I became Prime Minister, if you wanted to start a new independent school, you could do so, but you'd get no federal financial help if you established that school in an area already serviced by a government school or a local Catholic parish school. And it's the history of education in Australia is to its incredible credit the Catholic community of Australia maintained a separate, uh, fully funded by them, uh, education system for 100 years after uh, the churches, in effect, withdrew from state education, mm. uh, from education in the uh, 19th century. And so you have this situation where the great bulk uh, of the independent sector is made up of low uh, and modest fees. In Australian terms, you can get a very good education in one of these independent schools, and they could be Catholic, they could be Anglican, mm -hmm. Lutheran, Jewish, Muslim, and you can get it for, you know, in the region of ten to $12,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there will always be schools that charge a lot more than that, and be a lot of people who can afford that, and that's fine. But you've got to give that option to people. And yeah. what I like about the, the charter schools is, is that you could start one of those and, in a sense, set your own pace and have your own values. That's right. Uh, that's with, right. With, and well, that's and it's all about choice. That's it. So, that, so that has been a tremendous... One of, the, one of the great things that the Conservative Party has done in mm. office in the last 30 I years. I thought what been, Michael been Graves in that era was very good. Yeah. yeah. So, John, thank you. I want to just broaden the conversation a bit to, to global events. And, and I have here, I, I went into the House of Commons Library on my way over this morning and said, what have you got on John Howard? And they gave me this book, which has got a picture of you with Tony Blair. Uh, and you pretty much exactly mapped with Blair's time in office, I think. Uh, well, I was the only Australian Prime Minister that Blair dealt with. Yeah. And when I became Prime Minister, John Major, 
was still Prime Minister of Britain and when I left Gordon Brown as Prime Minister. That's right, that's right. So and you I overlapped him. Uh, I mean, I want to know what you thought of him, because for, for, for us Conservatives, he's, he's where all the trouble began. It's probably, probably unfair on that, but, you know, culturally, constitutionally, economically... <laughs> But actually, as a, as a world leader... I thought you'd get around to this, uh, yes. As a world leader, he stood with you and, of course, with George Bush. Yeah. Uh, and I reckon you got along with him. I got on, along with him very well. I keep in touch. My wife and I were in um, London only a couple of months ago. We went to Lords and we went to Leeds. And oh, yes. Got a great like Ashes series. <laughs> yeah. Keep talking, yeah, go on. No, no, Moving anyway, um, Bush and I, I'm um, sure Bush and I got on very well. Blair and I did get on well. I respected him. Um, I quoted him a lot in Parliament, particularly at the Labor Party. He had a wonderful saying that <clears throat> fairness in the workplace starts with the chance of a job. Hmm. And that, to me, made a lot of sense, particularly when I was arguing the case for an industrial relations system that would expand employment opportunities. Yeah. Look, on international affairs, we had similar views. Domestic affairs, well, we didn't talk about them much. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I agreed with everything he did. He probably didn't agree with everything I did, but uh, there's, there wasn't much point in us getting into that. No. So on, on global affairs, and I guess on international security most general, more, more broadly, you, you were, of course, Prime Minister through the war on terror, through Afghanistan, Iraq, and you committed Australia to those battles. What do you see as the nature and the role of what we might call the Anglosphere today? Do you think it's as strong and as important, and do you think there's a specific role for us? Well, our, for our it is almost instinctive at the upper reaches of the military hmm. that when you get into a scrap, those countries come together. Hmm. I mean, I've talked to many <coughs> senior people in the American military and the British military and our own military. They respect the fighting capacities of those uh, partners. They've fought together. I mean, uh, we have been involved with America in every military conflict in the, which the United States have been involved since hmm. the Battle of Hamel in World War I and, of course, the shared sacrifice of Australian diggers and British Tommies is, is legendary and uh, our traditions, and that doesn't mean that we don't value the partnership. I mean, one of the things I'm very proud of is the liberation of East Timor, and I was able yes. to put together uh, a partnership of Southeast Asian countries. It wasn't just yeah. Australia and New Zealand, and don't forget our partnership with New Zealand. It's very close. Yeah, well, and it's a great thing to be... Uh, that, that that relationship endures, and it's been strengthened recently with a new treaty between our countries. Just in the last minute or two, John, I want to talk about the, our cultural security, and Catherine there mentioned multiculturalism. <coughs> if you think of our shared values, Australia, the UK, US, Europe, how, what, are, what are the values that bind us together at this time? Well, they're, they're, they're values of, of uh, shared freedom, of institutions. I often say that um, uh, Australia did the right thing with its British heritage. It chose the really good bits. It chose the rule of law. It chose free speech. Yes. It chose um, the freedom of the press. And so it's it, the monarchy still? It, oh, it's yes, we'll come to that. Mm. And, and it chose quite a bit of um, a sense of humour. Not all of it, <laughs> but uh, quite a bit of it. But what it didn't choose was a class structure uh, or an aristocracy. Now, how countries organise those things, their business. But that wasn't fit for purpose in Australia. And of course, you've got to remember that we have a very deep deposit of what I call Celtic scepticism, because the uh, Irish and Scottish influence in Australia is just as deep in, in some aspects of our character, more so than the English. But we did those things well, mm. and, and that sense of balance is always something that's characterised us. Multiculturalism is a concept that I've always had a bit of trouble with. I take the view that if people want to emigrate to a country, it, it, it's on the basis that um, they adopt the values 
and the practices and the standards of that country, and in return, they're entitled to have the host citizenry respect uh, their culture without trying to create some kind of federation of tribes and cultures. You get into terrible trouble with that. <clears throat> I mean, I can remember from my political career, you, you, you go to a lot of local events, and particularly in the bush, you go to the, bar, the progressive barn dance, and uh, you uh, uh, meet a lot of people. And, and I lost count of a number of times. I mean, these wonderful uh, ladies uh, who emigrated to Australia from, you know, from the a Baltic country or from Croatia or from Greece or Italy, not long after World War II, and they say, we came to this wonderful country because you were free, you were kind, you were generous. Yeah, and now they're and, 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 and I mean, I think, isn't that yeah. terrific? Now, do you really have to try and redefine that relationship? And I think one of the problems with multiculturalism is that we try too hard to institutionalise difference rather than celebrate uh, what we have in common. What we have in common. Yeah, well, and, and, and John, this recent referendum has been so encouraging to us. Oh, well, the referendum we've made, if anybody yeah. is here yesterday who heard magnificent Senator yeah. Jacinta Price, and that was a a thumping, or as you British often say now, stonking endorsement uh, of um, uh, just how um, united we are. We don't want separation based on race or background. We want a natural acceptance. And this is a problem that the Americans are facing. I remember years ago, and I'll shut up after this so I can see you're getting agitated by that. Uh, <laughs> um, I remember reading a book uh, written by a fellow called Schlesinger, who, if I recall, was John Kennedy's speechwriter. Yeah. And the book was called, the title was The Disuniting of America. And it said that for years after the Civil War, the philosophy of a melting pot was adhered to. And in more recent times, and bear in mind that was the 1960s, um, we'd started, they'd started talking a lot more about the different That's tribes. and. Yeah. That was a mistake in America, and it's a mistake here. What is a success is what was demonstrated in Australia a couple of weeks ago, and the fact that when the king was crowned, as Neil Ferguson pointed out, you had a prime minister of a Hindu background, a foreign secretary of a different background, and, and yet that, that had emerged now, that hadn't emerged because of the philosophy of multiculturalism. It emerged because of the character of the people of this country. And it's something that you should continue to celebrate for that reason and that reason alone. John, you're an inspiration. We're honoured to have you. Thank you.